I'm going to talk about curious case of Ruby's memory. And it's uh, two talks roll into one because you know that's what I wanted to do. And who here have used Ruby 1.8 in production? 1.8. Ah, so you remember the pain, right? <coughs> Ruby has garbage collection, and it always had since 1.8. Uh, and up to 1.9, how it used to work? It was mark and sweep. So the garbage collection had two phases, the marking phase and the sweeping phase. The, in the marking phase, all the objects that have references are marked. And whatever is not marked is sweeped away as an deleted. And that was pretty good. It was efficient, simple, and easy to reason about. Except the problem is that if you're running a Rails app with, that, has, that is taking 400 MB, and you have probably a million objects on your heap, then traversing this entire heap each time is very costly. So Ruby 2.1, KO1 brought generational GC. So three cheers for <coughs> generational GC. Uh, the insight that generational GC has is like most objects die young. Uh, they, start, they, 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 they barely survive as one or two garbage collections, actually. So what does it do? Is these blue guys here, if you can see, if they were, what Ruby uh, sees on the major GCs is if these guys survive uh, a predefined number of garbage collections, they are moved to this generation called old generation. And, and uh, whenever more memory is required, first a minor GC is performed, and these old generation objects are not uh, touched at all. So as you can imagine, garbage collection is a lot faster. That's very nice. But there's a problem. <laughs> Let's say you have this hash called active users, and you're storing, that's a, that, that's a hash that pretty much is live through your entire lifecycle of application, and it stores in a reference to this user object, which is a new guy. And so that's the case here. So you can see an object in old generation refers to object in new generation. The problem is, on a minor GC, the Ruby is not going to check old generation for references at all. So your user object might be deleted, even though somebody is holding reference to it, actually. So that will be a really bad bug. So all generational garbage collectors typically implement this trick called remembered set, where what they do is whenever an old object tries to, uh, or you write something to an old object, uh, it's put into this different set called remembered set. And on minor GC, not only your young generation is uh, traversed, but your remember set is traversed as well. So now you can see that you know, like the user object will not be garbage collector erroneously. So that's pretty good. And that's what JVM does and other uh, VMs do. But <coughs> Ruby has a problem that if you're running a Rails app, it probably has at least 10 or 20 C extensions loaded. And these C extensions can do crazy things. They can, they can, you know, like they can take a, your Ruby pointer and they can put something in that array via C, and Ruby won't know about it that there's a, this, this array, which is an old generation, had just added a new object. So something, I'm just giving examples. Uh, we are adding something to a Ruby array, not like a C array, and you know, like doing MEMS CPY, copy into a Ruby array, and this object is an old generation. So what will happen is Ruby is again not aware that old generation, an object is old generation is holding reference to an object in new generation, and this object could be deleted, you know, like on a minor GC. So this is a big problem. Unlike JVM, Ruby doesn't own the heap space of a process completely. So to work around this problem, uh, what KO1 introduced was something called write barriers. And, and what it does is 
but it's somewhat something simple and very great is like it marks objects, it, it categorizes objects into two categories. Shady objects and sunny objects. When you touch an object, when you take a Ruby object and you do something with it in, in C uh, via any of the macros or methods, uh, macros particularly, then the, the object is marked as shady object. And not a whole lot of, uh, like if you're writing a C extension and if you're writing your own custom data structures, they all are shady actually. There are only very few, uh, the, the hash and array procs are by default shady. So a lot of objects in Ruby are shady actually. And what happens is that on minor GC now, not only young generation is marked, but young generation, all the shady objects, and all the remembered set objects are trouble. So it kind of, the, the, the bad part about it, it's like it kind of uh, takes away the benef benefit of generational GC because, you know, like we are uh, traversing more objects. We are looking through more objects even, in a, even on a minor GC, actually. But the advantage is that it's 100% compatible with almost all the C extensions out there. And yeah, so the objects that are that are not uh, uh, that like uh, that you're not accessing from C and just doing in Ruby, they generally will be right protected and they will be marked as sunny objects and they will not be touched. So, so the key ta takeaways from so that's how Ruby's you know like generational GC works in 2.1, 2.1. Uh, 2.2.0 uh, is bringing something called incremental GC, uh, which means that the, not just two generations, not just young and old, but there will be more than one generation. And there are trace points hooked that fire. And then there's a symbol GC coming in 2.2.0 as well, which will reduce the heap size further. So it's, all, all that is pretty great. Key takeaways from this talk is don't use low-level access for Ruby data structures like R array pointers. Uh, Ruby actually provides APIs uh, like functions that you can use if you have if you're writing a custom uh, data structure that you want to expose to Ruby, not just keep it in C. You can you can expose a C data structure to Ruby, right? So you can mark that as write protected. There are functions to do that. So use that. So that's about it. Now, next thing I'm going to talk about is how to tune the <coughs> garbage collector via environment variables. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to take a trip back to the memory lane and talk about memory profiling Ruby applications. It was horrible, right? Like Twitter had to use DTrace, and then experts had to be brought in, actually, like, you know, like uh, people from Expandables and things like that. So it was hard. And uh, usually profiling looked like, looked like, you know, like a graphics dump or something you used to get, and then you just see what's going on, and it's terrible. Now, thanks to Ruby 2.1, which has uh, trace points, it has great instrumentation support. I, I work for a company called Codemancers, and, I, and we, as a team, decided to do something about it. Although this was not our full-time work, we decided we are going to build a Ruby profiler, which will be as easy to use as something like your kit, which you can use in production with, with very low overhead, and it doesn't cause problems with your application. And I'm happy to present to you RB kit. I have never announced it before. It is first time I'm showing it off to people at uh, Rocky Mountain. So yeah, so it's up on GitHub. We just uh, open source it a few days back. And there's a, there's a, it's a two-part application. You can see this is a snapshot, uh, a picture of the app. I'm going to actually demo it, how to use it. It runs on OS X. It runs on Linux. So and it's great. And it's not one person effort. It's like four people from uh, Bangalore are working on it. So not full time as part time at this place where we work. It was not easy, you know, like to, to delve into, to convince a bunch of Ruby developers to go do C. The, the RB kit gem is written mostly in C because a lot of uh, uh, trace points only work in C. And then the desktop app is written in Qt C++. So it was very hard 
for, there was a fear factor actually. So, you know, like, oh my God, I gotta do C. What if it, you know, like I do something funny with the pointer, what's gonna happen? So, but we did it. And, and, and it's when, so C is for us something that, you know, like Linus Torvalds wrote, uh, it was hard, but we did it and we built Arbicate. So what is Arbicate? Arbicate is a low overhead review profiler built for MRI, written almost completely in C. It has two parts, a desktop application and a Ruby gem. What is the great about Arbicate is like, the gem, Ruby gem, doesn't do much other than gathering the data of your, you know, like uh, the data, okay, this object has been deleted, this object has been created, this object holds references to this object, it doesn't do anything else. And it sends all the data via 0MQ to the desktop client. It uses message pack in C as the serialization format. It's just real fast. Great thing about 0MQ is 0MQ has its own uh, IO threads, actually. So when we send the data, we are not going to block the Ruby thread or Ruby processing, actually. It, it, I can send million messages, and it's just going to work. So the beauty is a, a profiler that can be used in production. Using Arbicate is real simple. Just in your Rails app, you can just put gem uh, Arbicate, and then in the boot.rb, you can put require Arbicate, Arbicate start profiling. It actually will listen to a, to a socket for incoming uh, client desktop connections. And yeah. Next thing I'm going to talk about is Arbicate app, the desktop app. It's a cross-platform app written in Qt, C++, RAN, your Qt bindings, we looked at it, and yeah. And we do, uh, Qt has this thing called WebKit. Uh, uh, Qt has a widget called WebKit, so you can render certain portions of your, par, uh, of, your, uh, of your application using WebKit, JavaScript, D3JS, whatever. We use SQLite. So as I said, in this application, all the heavy lifting is done in the client side, like, you know, like which object holds references to what object, where it was allocated, all that stuff. And we, we benchmarked various, uh, you know, like uh, uh, GUI libraries, and we came to the conclusion that Qt C++ really matches what we are trying to do. And we didn't want to build a OSX only application that unfortunately pervades the Ruby culture. So we wanted to have it work on both OSX, Linux, and preferably Windows if we can. We can still render the certain pages using plain HTML via the Qt WebKit bridge. The tools we use, it will be funny if a, if a memory profiler itself leaks, right? You don't want to use that in production. So two tools that are very important is Valgrind, and another tool that we use is called Simple Command Line Program. It's available on OSX leaks. Just run it right now, and you can, uh, if you have OSX, then you can run it right now, and you can track memory leaks in your C applications using leaks very easily, actually. It's great. So the status report. is Arbicate is not going to be just about memory profiling. We are going to build uh, CPU profiling as well. Right now, today, our memory profiling pretty much works. Uh, uh, CPU profiling isn't works, and, and it's open source. So Arbicate demo time. Let's see if it works, right? Okay. So this is the client. I need to resize it slightly. Okay. I hope you guys can see it in all its entirety. Okay, so I'm going to just click connect because it needs to connect to a, a running Ruby application. And I'm going just to press this thing. One great thing about uh, ZMQ is that the server need not be running for clients to start connecting. So I'm running this, and now if I go switch to the, this thing, you can see that it's the live profile is on, and we can see there's a, there's a GC stat. Almost three seconds it took for the GC run, and the object count growing, and then you can see the memory size, heap size, rest memory size, and the heap size of the process, and you can see all this various stats. 
Now, I can uh, generally, if you're profiling a Rails app, it's always a good idea to trigger a GC before you take a heap dump. So I'm going to, I can trigger a manual GC here, and then I can take a heap snapshot. It shows a neat progress bar as it takes, but you cannot see it because it's just, yeah. So this is the, the status of the heap. It's showing all objects that are there live on your heap. And I can see that I'm leaking. Not, uh, there's objects, 29,000 strings allocated there. There's, there's this foo class that has like on line 90 is 12,000, and then it holds references to 24,000. Then you can see there's a hash here and the, uh, that holds references to 49,000 objects. I can view references and I can see all this stuff where is all these references coming from. We can, of course, take another heap snapshot because one snapshot is not good enough and then yeah, and then I can compare heap snapshots, actually. And then, God, where is it? OK. This is the time I miss mirroring. I cannot get to that. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just going to enable uh, do mirroring for a second so that I can see what you guys are seeing. All right. So, yeah. So I just did compare snapshots, and I can see that, you know, like, these are the objects that were there in heap two, but not in uh, heap one, heap snapshot one. And I can see, okay, where they are coming from. So there's something going on on line number 21. Obviously, I intentionally wrote an app that leaks actually to demo what I want to demo. But this is like the, this you can do already, you can download a DMG file, just double click and download the gem and run it. Simple and yeah, it's easy. Hey, Pip. So next uh, is like, I hope this was not enough. So we are going to talk about more stuff. And I'm going to talk about GC tuning visualizations. Now that we have built this, we can do crazy things with once you have all the data available on, on a zero MQ socket. There's a zero MQ to web socket bridges, people. Because it can go crazy. But I'm going to just use RBKit, the desktop application, to show you some cool stuff with uh, GC tuning that, that you know you have read in blog posts and everything. It's out on the internet. You can find it. But I'm just going to make it look like, make it more you know, like apparent to you how it affects your application's performance. The first one is simple one, Ruby GC heap INIT slots. The number of heap slots that Ruby starts with. The, Default value is small, and you can find out like 60,000, 600,000 uh, on blogs if you go read it. So I'm going to just stop this, and first thing I'm going to do is unzip whatever I have said. Come on. Okay. So one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want the GC to trigger quite often because that could be detrimental to your application's performance. If you're running unit tests uh, on your own machine, like uh, a triggering GC on when the Rails boots up, could be you know like bad. So I have uh, unset whatever I had already set, and I'm going to just start the RPKit th thing, and I'm just going to connect, and then I'm going to run this script that, you know, like, that does 
something here. So as you can see that by default, uh, there will be uh, already there's a GC trigger happening. Uh, it's kind of bad, right? It, it means like you're running slowly. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to set it to a higher value, sorry. I'm going to set it to a value like this. So one of the things that I did not implement it, we did not implement it in RBK desktop client is uh, cleaning all the state and restarting a new profiler. So that's the reason I'm starting new, uh, uh, start closing that application and starting from fresh. I, I hope that won't be too much of a problem for, but I need to connect. So this time I, anyway. So this time you will see that no GC happening actually. So this thing is a little bit obscured, but you can see that major GC count is zero, and there's no GC here on the charts as well. So when we set, set the, the INIT slots to a higher number, this, uh, the, the number of GC counts have dropped. So that was one. Second one I we want to talk about is like the Ruby GC heap growth factor, which is like uh, Okay, when Ruby needs more memory, uh, Ruby Ruby's, Ruby does not store all the objects in Ruby's heap, by the way. Ruby heap has, uh, Ruby stores, there's a heap slot where all R, value, R, R values are stored, and then there's a, if an object needs more than what, it, what can accommodate in that heap slot, it uses typical, XM, uh, typical malloc call to take memory from C heap and create and allocate more memory. So, Let's talk about what focus on Ruby heap. When Ruby needs more memory on its heap, then it uses this environment variable to, to keep track, okay, by how much the heap growth should be. The default value is 1.8. Some people suggest to keep it, you know, like a, a lower value and, or a higher value. I have just, I'm going to uh, set it to 1.99 and, uh, and demo this. But before that, I need to unset the INIT slots so that uh, the, the, because the in, if the initial number of slots is higher, then the GC is going to occur much later and we'll be sitting here and waiting for GC to happen. So, all right, so. Oops. So if you keep an eye, keep an eye on this, this one, this blue one is what represents the Ruby's heap size, not really the, and this, uh, this, this gray color represents the actual live object size. Live object size means the objects that were allocated even on C heap, all are included. So you can see here, the, the, the size was initially approximately one MB and it grew to more than one, one MB and then it grew by whatever factor we defined in the environment variable. So it had direct impact on that. So, that's great, and yeah. so we covered these two. Now, yeah, another thing I wanted to talk about is the Ruby heap versus C heap. The R value size forty bytes, but for for a for a typical application like Rails application, uh, the strings and objects are going to be of much bigger size, and they are not going to fit in the heap slot, actually. So Ruby uses Ruby XML lock to take memory from C heap and, and you know, like, allocate objects for it. Uh, usually, Ruby doesn't keep track of accurate memory that, is, that has been allocated through uh, ML lock, but it, it knows roughly. So, yeah. Usually, so, like, uh, if I, Earlier case, I, I was allocating str small strings. So if I, if I just increase the size of strings, you will see a. You will see that this, uh, the. 
the rest memory size, which is the, the memory taken by all the live objects, is going to go much higher, actually, when, when, when you're allocating larger strings. If I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be even allocating a class or something, then all the objects will fit right in the, the heap, actually. And, and this will be same as this. So that's, that's another insight that we can draw from looking at, at this data. All right, so next thing I want to talk about is uh, Ruby GC amalloc limit. And this is another important factor that controls uh, how frequently uh, GC runs. So to demonstrate this one, I what's the idea here is like the initial heap slots and growth, growth factor are not alone to control how frequently GC happens. Ruby GC amalloc limit is another variable which, which controls on C heap how much memory is allocated then, and if, if that much memory is already allocated, then the GC should ha happen. The default value is 16 MB. It means that if your application has already allocated 16 MB on the C heap, then or, or via malloc, then it's going to you know like trigger a new GC. Even though let's say if your initial GC uh, initial heap slots number was pretty high, but heap slots don't store all the objects as you know. So this uh, this variable controls all the live objects that that require more than 40 bytes. So so if your uh, so 16 MB is generally a much lower value. So we can see this with a Rails app. First thing I'm going to do is, all right, I'm going to define a real high value for, for this one. And I'm going to unset whatever I defined here. But it doesn't matter, actually. Right. Then I'm going to start. Rest up app. I already have included uh, uh, I've already included rbkit here, rbkit in gem file and rbkit.start profiling, so it already uh, knows how to do this. And I have the profiler running, connected, really nice. And I just need to do, I usually it's much better idea whenever you're profiling an app, Rails app in particular, to start in production environment. So as you can see, even though the even though like the INIT slots value is much higher, uh, even on boot there's already been uh, GC here, and as application grows, there will be more number of GCs actually. So this is you don't want this to happen as well. So what we can do is what if we close that and define a higher value of a malloc limit? This is 64 MB. And this, restart, sorry about this. Oops. Oh, God. Stop. Almost done. OK. So, so you can see that, like, The number of garbage collection, collections that you will see now will be much lower. Hopefully, okay, it just crashed. It crashed actually, so there's some problem here. So, yeah, so that's all I have for this thing. The code is already available on GitHub, and uh, you can use it. Um, you find it on Twitter and everywhere. And my name is Hemant Kumar. I'm from Bangalore and Atlanta. Depending on which time of year it is. Thank you.
questions? I have time for one or two sh small questions. So, so the question is, what kind of overhead do you see when you run RBKit in production? And the answer is like there are, RBKit can be run in two ways. One way it can just, in one way it can just start the server and it will start the zero MQ server, but it won't install the trace point hooks. So it's just listening for trace point hooks. So it's, in that mode, it has zero performance penalty actually. Then if you connect to, to, uh, through the, from the desktop, you can desktop client, you can manually trigger start, okay, start profiling. And at that time, there indeed is a some performance penalty because uh, the, uh, when each object is being allocated, we are running some code. So, yeah, but there's, it's still not that bad because all we are doing is putting objects, recording them, and putting them in a hash table, and then like every, you know, like every thousands, every thousand milliseconds or one second, we are sending that data back to the desktop client, so, yeah? So the question is, this is quite a big project. What kind of problem you guys had that made you write so much code? So, we have been, uh, I've been working with, a, with a, the client in England, and, and we had some issues there with memory, with memory users of Rails processes. And, but beyond that, I was in general like very much you know, like enthusiastic by the, tra the, the instrumentation support that was there in 2.1, and I wanted to see what can be built on top of it. There are a lot of command line tools, and then you can uh, write a dot file and then process it with graphics and do something like that. But they, are, they feel so inaccessible too, you know, like a, a, a common developer actually sometimes. So I just thought, you know, like, okay, we can do something really great with it, so let's, let's do that. So that was more than idea than the, yeah, so I didn't want to go a lot into that, but this third link, and obviously I'll be posting the slides online, and, and so it covers the, all the environment variables, their explanations uh, in, in a lot of detail, actually. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you again. Yeah.